If you look at the news recently, you may get the impression that the Cold War never ended. As things heat up in Europe, it certainly seems to be very much alive in the minds of some politicians and commentators. Is Putin really going to invade Ukraine? This video cannot answer that question as only time can tell. However, now is the perfect time to take a look at how flare-ups have looked in the past. Welcome to Historian's Corner. And today, let's look at the biggest provocation against the West Russia has ever committed, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Although it is most commonly referred to as the Cuban Missile Crisis, these tense few weeks have also been referred to as the October Crisis of 1962, the Caribbean Crisis and the Missile Scare. The crisis lasted for a month and four days from October 16th to November 20th in 1962. The incident was caused by the Soviet Union deploying ballistic missiles in Cuba. Why did they do this? Well, the United States had missiles in Italy and Turkey that were uncomfortably close to the Russian border. So in their mind, it was only fair. Many historians will say that this is the closest that the Cold War ever got to going nuclear. Soviet First Secretary Nikita Khrushchev agreed to Cuba's request to put nuclear missiles on their island. Cuba was worried that America was going to invade their country. This paranoia was understandable since, less than a year earlier, the US had secretly financed a failed invasion by former Cubans. Known as the Bay of Pigs invasion, this failed attempt really set the stage for the missile crisis and almost set the nukes flying. This allowed the Soviets to convince Cuba that if they had nuclear missiles, America would never attempt to invade them again. Khrushchev and Fidel Castro had a secret meeting in July, and construction began on missile launch facilities. Hidden in the hold of ships disguised as timber freighters, Soviet missiles and other combat resources were brought to Cuban soil. Soviet soldiers used the cover of darkness to unload what they could from the ships at night. To continue the operations during the day, they dressed as tourists and Cuban soldiers in an attempt to hide their identity. The US wasn't totally sure that this was going on until an Air Force U-2 spy plane took some undisputable photographic evidence. The picture showed medium-range R-12 and intermediate-range R-14 ballistic missile facilities just 90 miles away from Florida. This was cause for great concern, as from this position, the medium-range missiles could reach Washington within 13 minutes of launch. When these pictures made it to JFK's desk, he had a meeting with the nine members of the National Security Council and some other advisors who ended up being known as the Executive Committee of the National Security Council. These people advised JFK to airstrike Cuba to sabotage the Soviet missile supplies. The Cold War could have gone hot right then if JFK had listened to them. After reviewing his options, he ordered what he called a naval quarantine. A naval quarantine isn't really a thing, it was a blockade. However, by not technically calling it a blockade, JFK avoided committing an act of war which would have surely brought things to a boiling point. The US declared that they would no longer allow offensive weapons to be delivered to Cuba, and they also demanded that the weapons that were already in Cuba be dismantled and shipped back to Russia. Tensions reached a new high on October 24th. Soviet ships en route to Cuba came barreling towards the US ships and came uncomfortably close to crossing the blockade line. If they were to have crossed the blockade, escalation to all-out war would have most likely been unavoidable. To make matters worse, any act of war would have quickly escalated to nuclear destruction. Thankfully, the Soviet ships stopped just shy of crossing the blockade and pulled away from the US vessels. Tense negotiations ensued over the next several days. Tensions almost came to a flashpoint again on October 27th, when a US recon plane was shot down over the coast of Cuba. Although combat forces were gathering in Florida, troops were never deployed, and conflict was avoided yet again. The following day, US Attorney General Robert Kennedy hand-delivered a message to the Soviet ambassador stationed in Washington. JFK and Khrushchev had reached an agreement. There was a public part to the agreement as well as a secret part that the general population knew nothing about. Publicly, the Soviets would take apart the missiles in Cuba and take them off the island. 
the United Nations would be in charge of verifying this. In return, the US would issue a public declaration to not invade Cuba again. The secret part of the agreement involved a bit more on America's part. They agreed to dismantle all of the missiles that had been deployed in Turkey and aimed at Russia. It's still unknown if the missiles in Italy got removed as well. The Soviet Union let America keep this part a secret because JFK thought it would simply make him look too weak in front of the American public. This way, the PR from this whole incident wasn't nearly as bad. Both sides got to save face in front of their own citizens. Some Soviet bombers were allowed to remain in Cuba even though the missiles had been removed. The US also kept the so-called naval quarantine in place around Cuba until November 20th. The Cuban Missile Crisis came very close to slipping into an all-out nuclear war, and that was without the next piece of information. The most dangerous moment of the entire crisis, and perhaps the entire Cold War, wasn't recognized until 2002. The Cuban Missile Crisis Havana Conference, which was attended by many veterans, uncovered a minor incident that almost blew the whole thing up. The USS Beale tracked and then dropped signaling depth charges on a Soviet submarine. Unknown to the US, this submarine was armed with a 15 kiloton nuclear torpedo. The submarine was surrounded by American warships, but it needed to surface or else the crew would run out of air and suffocate underwater. An argument broke out among three officers on board the submarine. Captain Valentin Savitsky actually ordered that the nuclear torpedo be made combat ready. Accounts differ from here as to what exactly happened, but thankfully cooler heads prevailed and the submarine surfaced and torpedo was disarmed. The Cuban Missile Crisis drew attention to the fact that the United States and the Soviet Union really needed a better way of communicating with each other. They needed something that was fast and direct or else a delay or miscommunication could potentially lead to some mushroom clouds. The Moscow-Washington hotline was established to address this. The hotline was a system that allowed direct communication between the leaders of the two countries. It linked the Pentagon right to the Kremlin. In popular culture, it became known as the Red Telephone. But in reality, there was no red phone. There wasn't a telephone line at all, in fact. The first version of the hotline actually used teletype equipment, and then in 1986, they started using a fax machine. Since 2008, it's been a computer link where a secured form of email can be sent. Having a big red telephone just looks better for movies. Although the Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved without a nuclear war, there was no shortage of tension between Moscow and the United States. Miraculously, there was only one casualty during the crisis the pilot of the downed recon plane. As unfortunate as that was, that is nothing compared to what could have happened if nukes started flying. With the way things are starting to shape up with Moscow and Ukraine, the Cuban Missile Crisis quickly comes to mind. Do you think the situation with Ukraine is going to devolve into something that intense? Can things again be resolved diplomatically? Are there secret aspects to deals being made now that the public knows nothing about? Let us know what you think in the comments. Until next time, thanks for watching Historian's Corner.